Hey, everybody. Welcome to Real Ag Live, the agronomy chat uh, version of it. This is us testing this out to see how it's going to work. I am Sean Haney, uh, founder of realagriculture.com, and as well, the host of Real Ag Radio. You can hear every day on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM. So what our goal is today is Peter Johnson and I are going to have a chat. I've got some questions for Pete, but I definitely want to hear your questions as well. So we've got a few people already saying hello. Awesome stuff. So all you got to do is put your question or your comment into the chat box of the social media platform that you are watching on. And uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So usually Pete and I are really constrained by time. <laughs> Today, I don't know. Who knows how long we're going to do this for. So uh, let's call in uh, Peter Johnson here right now. Going to get, oh, I got the graphic up. There's a lot going on over here. Uh, let's get Pete in there. Hey, Pete, how's it going? It's going oh, absolutely, absolutely awesome, awesome, Sean. It's, it's, a, sunny it's a sunny day, day here. here. What does what that, does that mean, mean about my attitude? attitude? Well, it means you're in a good mood. <laughs> I'm, always I'm always in a good, in a good mood. mood. I'm just, I'm just in, a in a better, better mood, mood on, on sunny, sunny days. days. Come on. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Well, Pete, I'm looking forward to this chat. Uh, I see Jeremy Boychin is watching. Uh, Lindsay Smith of realagriculture.com says hello. So this is going to be a, a lot of fun. Hey, Pete, on, on Monday on Real Ag Radio, you were my guest, and we were we were talking about how early is too early. I'm looking out the window right now, and snow is flying in southern Alberta. We're usually one of the first to kind of – really really get going um we're, we're we're obviously not now uh, a lot of people across the country asking that question how early is too early yeah, yeah and, it's and it's never, never too, too early, early sean. sean well maybe, maybe it is it if it's, it's december, december but it's, but it's all, like like even, even for, you, for guys, you guys you've had, you've some, had windows some windows of opportunity, of opportunity, opportunity I, believe, I believe where you, where you could have gotten, gotten out before, before the snow, snow flew or or, or, or not 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 last, last december, december but before this recent snow and seeded some cereals so we have, so we have frost-seeded frost seeded cereals, cereals here in Ontario, Ontario now that, that are, are emerging. emerging. So, they're so they're already coming, coming out of the ground. The, the earliest, earliest one I heard was on February the 28th, and I, and I think, think that, that one was a barley, barley crop. crop. I'm not, I'm not positive, positive, but whether, whether it's, it's barley, barley spring, spring wheat, or oats, oats man, man you, you just you get, get them, them in the ground. ground. If, if, if you if can at all, you get them in the ground. And even Brian Barris in Alberta there has done some really nice work about soil temperature and seeding those cereals. And at the end of the day, he didn't go below zero. And I think we had this conversation, right? You stupid hole drill guys. Like you can't frost seed with a hole drill because if it's frozen, that hole drill goes in the ground and it just wants to rip everything all to heck. With a disc drill, you just slice through the frost and you drop it in the ground. So in B Brian's case, he didn't go below zero. For us, we'll go out there at minus four, minus five, slice through the frost and put it in the ground. And, and then it's there and it grows any time that, that soil temperature gets above zero or above plus two, depends on which cereal crop we're talking about, what the minimum temperature is. But if you if you think about it, if you have oats that are emerging on April 1st versus oats that are still in the bag, I know which one almost for sure has more yield potential. And so when, when you say how early is too early, ah, for cereals, it's never too early. Different story if we go to canola, we go to soybeans, like that's, that's a little different scenario, right? Yeah, and I Jeremy Boychin just uh, put a note in here saying, the first producer he knows of hit the ground today in Redwater, Alberta. How about that? Yeah. And, and so my only question to Jeremy is like, why not earlier, Jeremy? Why wasn't he out there like three weeks ago? Could he have done it? <laughs> I'm, I'm always pushing the guys to, to go outside the box, give it a try, see what happens. Sometimes you're amazed and sometimes it, it's an absolute bust, but that's how you learn. Well, I think the other part too is if you are going to test these early, early dates, you, you really want to make sure that you you trial it right it's on a small it's on a small percentage of acres you don't need to do it with you know 50 percent of your acres people tend to go in like two feet in uh that's good in some areas of life but in when you're doing some testing not, not so much yeah absolutely is it you remind me of the grower in southwestern saskatchewan who sent me an email asking if if durham would respond well to frost seeding and i said absolutely yes 
And he immediately, or he, I think he said, I want to try it on a quarter section. At some point in the conversation, he said, I'm going to do a quarter section, which just drives me nuts. What do you learn? It's the whole quarter section. And I fired that back at him. And, and then, of course, he just laughed and said, yeah, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to do it in strips, or maybe I'll do a, you know, a half of a, a quarter section here and a half of a quarter section there. So we, we get some comparisons, but you're absolutely right. You got to, you got to have a point of reference in Michigan right now. They're, they've been planting soybeans and they're planting soybeans exactly that to learn how far they can push the boundaries. And some of the other management thought processes come in as well. So they're planting the soybeans two inches deep because they don't want to get that soybean seed to start germinating and be too shallow and then get freezing temperatures and kill it. So they're trying to, to you know, use that soil as a bit of a buffer. And so there's a whole range of, of different thought processes you can try. And they won't all work, absolutely. But man, when, when you say how early is too early, uh, if you have a base zero crop like a cereal crop, you just get it in the ground absolutely as early as you can. A question for Jeremy, and you know, I think this is a this seems to be like a reoccurring thing. Is that there, there's growers out there still trying to deal with the 2019 harvest? We've still got some crop out, out there, Pete, right now in in Western Canada. We know we've got some issues with uh, some of the corn. We'll get to that in a second with some of the residue. Uh, but from a Western Canadian perspective, what do you what do you suggest in terms of manage some of this harvest before seeding? Recommendations on the approach at all? Yeah, so uh, you, you just get it out of the field as quickly as you can, right? And and we saw back in the fall, some guys were out there with rakes, kind of pulling the canola swaths out of the snow to shake the snow off so that they could get then go in and combine that canola, even though there was really too much snow to be combining. F- figure out how to get it out of the field as early as you can. Uh, if you have a dryer, then you've got a lot more opportunity to get it out at higher moisture and and not let it go out of condition but beyond that like being timely is everything in terms of western canada eastern canada like we're all a short season district we don't have the luxury of of going to the field whenever we want and if if you're tied up getting the the wheat or the canola harvested and not out there with the drill planting I don't know, there's a whole bunch of people probably looking for work, hire more drivers and have one guy combining and the, somebody else running the seeder right on his rear end so that it's getting seeded back immediately. Uh, figure that out. That's the real crux of the issue. <laughs> Sean from Southern Alberta, know him well, said, uh, should I use my snow brush to clean off my field before I seed? It's minus 13 <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, minus 13, we, we had a whole bunch of people combine and corn uh, two weeks ago, and it was minus 10, minus 13. It's all about, is it cold enough? Can you get it? How much snow is there? How do you deal with that snow? And I was really impressed with the guys that were finding ways to shake the snow out of the swath and then going out with the combine, even though there was snow there, the the swath was up above the snow then they could pull it out, of the, out and co- keep combining so i uh, i don't know there's there is no easy answer sometimes sean but boy if you don't don't let your your previous experience or what your dad did ever limit what you're going to do always try to think of other ways to try it and and then as you say go try a little bit if it fails what are you out so you tried you spent a day figuring, figuring something, something out, out and you learned learn. it doesn't work that's okay too hey sean do you hear that don't be limited by what your dad did. They're right there. I, I know Sean's dad well. <laughs> hey, uh, let's talk about that corn harvest in Ontario. How how has that gone, Pete? This is not no not the first time that people have been combining co- corn in in March. Uh, what is it kind of worked? How does it, how has the yield been impacted? Yeah, so we we don't have a real good base for how that yield has been impacted because it hard exactly tell we were getting so many fines last fall so the the one grower at near clinton uh or sorry not near clinton up near uh uh oh Ken, uh, come on kincardin kincardin actually sent me an email or a text and, and he said last fall 34 percent moisture and he was getting four percent fines right so so four percent fines how much are you grinding up how much are you throwing out the back like you're losing yield because of the amount of fines you're creating and and that 
it's hard to measure that. And then this spring, he, he actually went out and combined 200 acres of corn this spring. He was at 0.2% dock. So he went from stuff that he was grinding up and making feed out of in the combine bin to a nice grade three sample. It came up in grade. It was 18% moisture and had much better kernel integrity so he could handle the stuff and not not turn it into flour. So I don't know. The yield loss, there is yield loss. There's no question. The birds eat some. The deer eat some. The turkeys, we got lots of wild turkeys now. We're even getting some wild boar for crying out loud. So you're, you're going to lose some yield. But this year, we gained on moisture and we gained on quality. And so we we lucked out this year. Leaving it out for those growers at high moisture was the right choice. But, but not ideal <laughs> it's not something it's, it's sort of like late planting last year for corn and, and beans in Ontario it, it worked out because the fall weather worked out in our favor but it's not something that we would want to repeat so okay Sean Ontario is a big place right and I'm I'm an old guy I got lots of history here and so Steve Fong or he's passed away unfortunately but he used to leave corn out out every winter and he farmed near Kerr Woods, so he was out of the snow belt. They almost never got much snow, and he would combine corn in January on the frost. He wouldn't compact things. He would do it in March on the frost, and that was just his normal practice. I farmed near Lucan, and in 2012, we had corn at 202 bushels per acre, and we purposely left some out for some trials. We were thinking, okay, can we can we save the drying costs? Can we do all these things? Can we plant lower populations so we have better standability and spray a fungicide on that corn crop because that also improves stock quality and we'll leave it out all winter and we'll save the drying and we'll save the storage and it'll all be there in the spring. And I forget what day it was, the 5th of December or the 8th of December, something like that. The streamer came off Lake Huron and, and set up right over top of my farm at Lucan and right over London. And we got five feet of snow within about a day and a half. The snow went over the top of the cob. And when that snow melted, because it was over the cob, it just, it, it, it's like it sucks the corn plant straight to the ground. ground. And we took corn that was 202 bushels per acre, perfectly standing, gorgeous stuff. And in the spring, I combined it at 98 bushels per acre. And I tried the flex head. I couldn't pick it up. I, like there's, so, so there's huge risk to leaving it out all winter. Absolutely. Okay, here's another question from, from Jeremy. Uh, of Alberta wheat. He says, plenty of producers in southern Alberta wanting to try to underseed legumes and cereals. Watching, watching for the benefits in Ontario from your perspective, Pete. Uh, farming smarter here in southern Alberta has seen challenges the last three years from dry conditions, lack of establishment leading into variability and weed issues. Guidance for these producers. Do you have any tips there, Pete? That's a, ooh, yeah, that's a good so, one. So, oh, yeah. yeah abs- and, 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 and so actually, I have the same problem, right? And in winter wheat, when we try to underseed red clover, when we get a good stand, it's awesome. It's 75 pounds of nitrogen. It's an additional eight bushels per acre of corn. Uh, it increases your soil health. Like it just does so many wonderful things. The trick is to get that uniform stand. And we haven't figured that out yet. We've been trying and trying. And if we get good wheat, we just don't get a uniform stand. So when you don't have a uniform stand where the clover is good, it will give you good weed suppression. But where the clover is not good, then absolutely the weeds grow. And I think it really depends. And it when do you harvest that crop in Alberta? Is it a forage barley crop that you're harvesting early and you have a, a nice bit of season left so that whatever is growing there, if you do get it established, has a chance to generate some biomass? Or are you, I mean, if you went to the Peace River District, there's, I think there's no point in, in trying to intercede anything in, a, in the Peace River District because you combine in September and it freezes up in, I don't, know, I don't know, the end of September. There's no time for whatever plants you do get established underneath there to grow and provide any, any benefit. And I think everybody, I, soil health is awesome, but everybody has to look at that differently. And as, in terms of recommendations for those growers, if you, if you don't get a stand – with your underseed, then you need to, what we do is automatically in my red clover, I don't get a stand, I go seed oats into it. 
And were the red clovers good? I, I can drive through it and I'll never see any oats. The red clover will outcompete them and I'd rather have the red clover. Where the red clover's thin, the oats grow and then they compete with the weeds. But you need moisture to germinate that. And if you don't have moisture in Southern Alberta, uh, they did some cover crop stuff in Kansas and the cover crop was chewing up moisture and Kansas is really dry and they were reducing the yield in the subsequent crops. So moisture plays in that whole discussion. Speaking of all the snow that's out there right now for a lot of growers across uh, the prairies and Ontario, uh, good time to spread manure, right? Oh, you're driving me nuts, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so never never manure on snow. I, I never manure on snow. It's like Mario Tenuta is worried about putting ESN out because ESN will, ESN will float. Man, you put manure on snow, and when that snow melts, where does the manure go? It's never going to be uniform. It's never going to, like, just... Don't, don't do it. I'm out of that game. I, I'm so frustrated, but it keeps happening. And that's because the guys that have manure have too much manure and the other guys have no manure. And we just have to get better at distributing it and doing it at the right, uh, right time of, in terms of, of making use out of that manure. On, On snow, snow doesn't work. Good stuff. If you do have any questions, make sure you leave them in the chat box in the social media application that you are watching this stream on. And thanks a lot for tuning in here today for Real Ag Live Agronomy Chat. Uh, Pete, let's talk about sulfur. Um, the rate yeah. for that sulfur yeah. is such a big part of this. It's just super critical. Yeah, so it's really fun because and and I, farmers are always thinking, right, Sean? Like, man, it's cool uh, they they just just i don't know they're a they're a really interesting breed and maybe all people are and i hope all people are but mario out of quebec actually asked me about this and and i think this is a really fun thought process so you know with this whole covid thing bad as it is all the industry is shut down so with all the industry shut down does, does that mean there's less sulfur being put into the air and if there's less sulfur in the air does that mean less free sulfur out of the out of the air to my corn crop in Quebec or my wheat crop in Quebec and and should i be upping my sulfur application rate because we're going to get less out of the atmosphere and it is kind. Of, it is kind of like wow. I had not even thought about that, but it's a cool question. So if you think that through, though, I go back to 1990. In Ontario, Ontario, we were getting 30 pounds per acre per year out of atmospheric deposition, whether it was dry deposition, acid rain. Today depends on the year and what year and whatnot, but we're somewhere between four and eight pounds. So. If, if everything shuts down and it doesn't clean up immediately, but, it, you know, so instead of four to eight pounds, I, let's say I get two to four pounds. Well, that four pounds is, is not a big difference, a big, big difference from 30 to eight or 30 to six for sure. From six to four, we're all, if you're already applying some sulfur, I'm not sure that that reduction from the, uh, from the environment is going to be enough to, to make a crop respond or not respond. So I don't think that part of it is as big a difference today as it would have been in, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. The rate though, man, absolutely. The rate's incredibly important and the source is important and, and it's crop dependent. Okay. So kind of give me like a hierarchy of the crops where it's more critical than others. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, any, any high protein crop, that like so canola is a high sulfur demand wheat is a high sulfur demand alfalfa is a high sulfur demand and you don't think of alfalfa like hey really a high sulfur demand but what are we trying to grow like we want to grow 18 percent protein hey well gosh there's a lot of sulfur in protein and so all three of those crops tend to be quite high sulfur demand uh, you would say well okay protein crops soybeans a protein crop so soybeans should have a high sulfur demand but the difference with soy, soybeans is that their uptake demand is late in the year. So rain makes soybeans in August, right? And that's when the demand is, well, by the time they need the sulfur, the sulfur in the soil out of the organic matter has been released. And so they are not nearly as responsive as a canola crop or a wheat crop. And, it, and that's a little bit counterintuitive, but but it's... You know, how much does it use and it's when does it have that demand? Uh, typically, 
we want to see at least 10 pounds of sulfur on a, on a good wheat crop crop here in, in Ontario. And in fact, my really aggressive producers are thinking they need 15 pounds of sulfur. And you can kind of play a little bit. I hate ratios. I'm not a ratio guy, but, but 15 or pardon me, 10 to one is nitrogen to sulfur is kind of that ratio. So if you're a canola grower putting on 150 pounds of of nitrogen on your canola crop, you probably should be 15 pounds of sulfur, some somewhere in that range. Certainly, that's that's a good rule of thumb here in Ontario. The my growers that are at, at 135 pounds of nitrogen, and that's sort of the sweet spot for their yield. Uh, yeah, I want to see them at least 10 pounds, and maybe as many as 15 pounds. So that gets you in the game with with that thought process ar- around rate, and then make sure that it's available, right? So that's the other thing is that the sulfur has to be available when the crop needs it. Sorry, do you think sulfur is one of those nutrients that some, maybe doesn't give enough get enough attention as it should? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And and I'm astounded that I go places and I say, you know, how many people are putting sulfur on their winter wheat? And I think it should be 100% and I get sometimes maybe 20% of the people, be, you know, that are putting sulfur on their winter wheat crop. And I think a lot of that is because it's a fairly recent thing. I, I did sulfur research three times in my career. And the first two times I got zero response because 30 pounds out of the atmosphere was all we ever needed. And so it's it's just coming in, and I mean the the research that I did in 2010, we were getting 10 to 12 pounds of deposition in 2010. Now we're down to five or six or four. Well, my research needs to be redone because again, that's a 50% reduction out of the atmosphere. That means probably my my rate response curves aren't accurate anymore. And so for a lot of growers, I think. Uh, they just ex- they've expected it to come out of the organic matter. There is lots in the organic matter, so if you're if you're living off of that, it can work. But at the end of the day, I think we're getting to the point where pretty much every producer is going to have to have sulfur, particularly on sulfur responsive crops. Okay, uh, Real Ag field editor Kara Oosterhouse of Bow Island has a question. Uh, with split in application, is foliar or granular application better? Okay, okay so, so <clears throat> nitrogen, nitrogen does, does not, not go, go in, in well, well through, through the leaf. The leaf. And, and if you, if you, you can, can try, try to get, to get it, it in through the leaf, but the, but leaf, the leaf is, is not designed, designed to, take to take up that, that nitrogen. nitrogen. And, and nitrogen is a macro, macro element. element. So, so if, you, if, you, if you get, get a, a, I don't know, if you get... Manganese, manganese through, through the leaf. leaf. If, you, if you get a few, a few molecules, molecules of manganese, manganese through, the through the leaf, that's, that's enough, enough because, because it's, it's a, a micronutrient. micronutrient. A, a foliar on a wheat leaf, leaf you, get you get a few molecules, molecules through the leaf. It's like, like who cares? cares? Because I don't, I don't need, need a few. few. I need, I need uh, a thousand, thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, whatever that number is. I need massive amounts. So, so even, even when you put a foliar product on, ninety-five percent of the the nitrogen, the nitrogen you, you apply, apply foliar, foliar will be, will be up, up, taken, taken up, up by, by the, the roots, roots at, at least. least. And, and so, so I'm, I don't, liquid versus dry is a different discussion, but foliar versus soil applied, it, it's going to go in through the roots. So just get it down to the soil and get it into the root system where the plant can pick it up. As far as is liquid, so is 28% nitrogen U, UAN solution or 32%, so it's half ammonium nitrate, half urea versus dry urea, which of those is better? Well, the 28% solution, because it's, it's a liquid, it will sort of dissolve into the very top soil surface of the soil. And then if you have good humidity in the canopy and that soil gets wet overnight, you have high humidity and, and good soil moisture and the soil moisture wicks up to the soil surface, it will take that 28%, a bit of it each time that happens, dissolve it and take it down in where it is available to the roots. If you put a dry product, a granule right on the soil surface, then it needs rainfall to dissolve the granule before it can get into that soil surface and get down into the root system. So the liquid under marginal conditions is a little more available, but the differences is small. Uh, you know, Basically, a pound of nitrogen is pretty much a pound of nitrogen in that scenario. Okay, so I know you and I have talked about this before. Is it like in terms of the spoon feeding scenario, there is you need to be at certain amounts to make it effective. Is is that correct? Yeah. So 
the the Germans and the and the uh, UK people, the the high yield wheat people, they always say, if you're not putting on 50 pounds of nitrogen, why bother driving through the field? And to spoon th- feed things, if if you spoon feed five pounds of nitrogen, man, it's probably not enough to make a difference. We just we need a bigger shot than that. And the other thing is that if you're going to do it, like. Once you get a crop really powering along, you want to keep it powering along. I get that. So don't ever let it short. But look at the growth of the plant and say, man, where does it make sense to give it a decent amount of nitrogen as opposed to just a little trickle all the time? I mean, if we if we had drip irrigation and we could just always put the right amount of nitrogen through the drip irrigation line, that's one thing. But that, you know, we don't have that. So on a wheat crop, man, if, if you're going to try to spoon feed it like that well the research shows if i can get high nitrogen in the spike right that in the spike which is the the part of the head in between all the kernels if i can get high nitrogen in the spike at anthesis i can increase my kernel set and increase my yield so that's really cool stuff so in that case i want to i want a shot of nitrogen about flag leaf or boot stage assuming it rains to put it into the soil so the plant can pick it up and and spike that nitrogen in the the spike of the wheat crop or or you know power that nitrogen into the spike of the wheat crop at anthesis get more kernel set get more yield so I would way rather put a decent shot on then than be putting 10 pounds all the way along and just you know getting more more plant growth, more uh, foliar growth, which doesn't necessarily relate to more yield. Okay, question here via Twitter from Mark Davis says, uh-huh. what does a 10 part per million sulfur soil test equal in available soil samples pulled in previous fall? So I... Uh, Great question, Mark. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks for listening in. And and first off, I will quote Dave Franzen. So Dave Franzen, North Dakota State University, uh, soils researcher his entire career there. And in North Dakota State, they never had the luxury of 30 pounds of sulfur because they were out of the industrial shadow. Uh, in Ontario, we got 30 pounds of sulfur. You guys, uh, Sean in Alberta, you never got 30 pounds of sulfur there either because you just, well, it's all about geography, right? Dave Franzen has worked on sulfur because North Dakota State has needed sulfur a lot longer than we have in Ontario. And his answer is there is no sulfur soil test that works. So I talked to another grower this morning. He says, my my soil tests always come back low in sulfur. Everything else is fine. They're low in sulfur. Well, wait a minute. How deep did you soil test for that sulfur soil sample? Because sulfur is like nitrogen. If you're doing a phosphorus soil test, you take a six inch sample. Well, that doesn't predict sulfur. If we could predict sulfur, we have to go a foot deep. And so that's number one issue. And, and number two issue is, okay, so you have a number in the top six inches last fall. Well, if that's sulfate sulfur, it's like nitrogen. It leaches out over the winter time. So we know that whatever nitrogen we have on in the fall, we lose at least 50% over the winter in Ontario. So immediately that, that sulfur number is, becomes how much did I actually leach out? It doesn't all leach out, but, but we leach some of it out. And in my, in my earlier, you know, the other client that called and, and said his sulfur is always low, I said, I said, so how often have you seen sulfur deficiency in your corn? Never. Okay, so if you never see a sulfur deficiency in a crop that does respond to sulfur like corn, then chances are the sulfur soil test is not predicting what you want it to predict. But just to to absolutely answer Mark's question, if you have 10 parts per million in a 6-inch soil sample, so that's the equivalent of uh, 20 pounds per acre, you multiply by 2 and that gives you pounds per acre, so that's 20 pounds per acre of sulfur. Uh, last fall, what's it equate to this spring? Well, you lose at least half. For sure, you lose at least half. And then you just say, does the sulfur soil test work? Uh, Mark, you've got a great wheat crop out there. I know you do. Just make sure you put on enough sulfur. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pete, we got another question here from, uh, let's see here. And you can you can put your questions in the comment box on the social media app that you are watching on. Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook. We got a question here from Greece, from Constantino. He <laughs> says, there you go, get ready for it. Is copper critical for Durham wheat? Which micro elements you believe Durham wheat needs more of? 
Jeez. We, do you know much about Durham, Pete? We, we may have to call in Jeremy Boychin here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so fortunately, fortunately, Durham, Durham is, is, is just wheat. It really is. It's you know, it's it's a, a hexaploid, or pardon me, a, a tetraploid wheat instead of a hexaploid wheat like bread wheat. And you guys in Western Canada, you know, you got wheat and you got Durham, and Durham is not wheat. Baloney. Durham is wheat. It's just a different wheat. How important is is copper? And the answer is, how short on copper are you in your soil test? Or do you see copper deficiency symptoms? So Alberta is, in, in North America, Alberta is, is sort of the epicenter of copper deficiency. And you guys in Alberta on your sand knolls, uh, and Yian Evans, Dr. Yian Evans was the guy who kind of found this first, you go so copper deficient that you don't even get ahead out of, out of the wheat crop if you don't apply some copper. So can it be the limiting factor? The answer is absolutely. Copper can be the limiting factor. Meanwhile, you come to Ontario, I have yet to confirm copper deficiency in a wheat crop anywhere in the province, and I've been in this province a long time. In Ontario, I get on a muck soil or I get on heavy clay soils, I will get manganese deficiency. And if we don't apply manganese, particularly, uh, or, or tobacco sand, man, they're the worst. Tobacco sand, I have to apply manganese three times or the wheat will actually die. So when Constantine asked me, you know, which are the most important micronutrients, they're all important. Uh, you don't need much of them, but if you don't have them, they're, they're critical or the plant cannot reproduce. So the critical micronutrient is really what you are deficient in your area. And man, I have no idea what they're deficient in in Greece, man. I just, I have no stinking clue. You, you got to admit when you don't know, Pete. Uh, uh, get yourself I don't know, and, and I don't, I don't know. know. I'm, I'm not, not there. Uh, question here is in regards to spring weed control. Uh we, it's always a bit of a battle. Uh, last year we had in Ontario a lot of crop go in, uh, planted, and then worried about weed control maybe post-planting. Uh, that's obviously a strategy that happens lots here in, in Western Canada as well. Uh, any thoughts on uh, spring weed control? So the, the answer is, yeah, it, it's a really simple program. It's called Start Clean, Stay Clean. What more do I need to say, Sean? Okay, so because I've seen a lot of that data, you know, we, we everybody always focuses on corn. Uh, Dr. Clarence Swanton at the University of Guelph, you know, where we, you know, the earlier we tackle those weeds in that corn crop, the the, high, the we never knock ourselves off that optimum yield curve. Uh, it's the same uh, data coming out on soybeans. I'm going to assume it's the same in other crops like canola and wheat. You know, for a while there, we, oh, I want that second flush to come, so I'll I'll get it all in one pass. And we're, and we're finding out that uh, that probably is not the best way to, to manage your spring weed control. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so the problem with waiting for the second flush is, well, you don't know when it's going to happen. It happens when it rains. When's the rain going to come? By the time the rain comes, the first flush, not only has it reduced your yield already, but sometimes those weeds are so big that they've gotten incredibly tough to kill. So... From a weed control standpoint, and even in, in spring cereals, you re, the, there's a little bit of work, not very much, but Clarence had a student that just looked at barley, and with spring cereals, it looked like the three-leaf stage. If the weeds were not dead by the three-leaf stage of the crop, that you were losing yield. And you don't lose as much yield in a cereal crop because it's more competitive than you do as in a corn crop. Corn is probably one of the most sensitive crops to that early season weed control. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of cool things that we could get into. Like with soybeans, we can plant soybeans into a, a living rye cover crop and sort of get away with that without nearly as much impact as with corn. You do it with corn and I will you know, just about guarantee that you are going to suffer some yield loss. So every crop is a little bit different. But at the end of the day, you just, if you can, 
keep the weeds out of there all the way through, that's going to give you maximum yield potential. And and I think that's exactly what Clarence has found out. Uh, there's other places, uh, Michigan State's d- done some work, and you lose, uh, I think it's a bushel per acre for every inch of height that the weeds get to. And so, you know, you have six inch weeds. Oh, it got to, it was more than that by the time it got to six inch weeds. But like, there's just, the bigger the weed, the more yield loss you have. So keep them out of there if you can at all. And I think in, I think many places in the, in the spring cereal crop in particular, and even in winter wheat, I want my weed control done in the fall, not in the spring, because it's the early weeds in the spring that really rob yield from the wheat crop. So yeah, uh, just get it done. The start, start clean, clean, stay clean. It's easy for me to say it's a whole lot tougher to do, but we've learned with IP soybeans, with edible beans, that it's always a two pass program. If you have a second flush, it's called a second pass. And you mentioned the fall weed control being better, and that's been one of the big challenges, right? You look at it in the, in the prairies last year, harvest was late, and we're dealing with all this crap and you don't get a chance to get your fall weed control done. You're still looking at a crop out in the field, and that that carries over into the spring, and it just you know sort of the problem compounds itself. Yeah, absolutely, and and th- I mean you can't trump m- Mother Nature, but if you can do fall weed control, and even in Ontario, man, if we could do fall weed control after the corn came off, uh, we've seen really good results. You think how it's November. Remember the 10th, how can spray and glyphosate uh, do anything? Man, on things like perennial sow thistle, uh, some of those weeds, dandelions, next spring, they are essentially really damaged and, and we get excellent control out of, out of fall weed control applications. So if you, when you can, do it. When you can't, it, it's just life. It's called farming. And never short of any challenges. Um, uh, we got a few more minutes here, Pete. Uh, Mark Davis asks, "What rate for bushel per yield goal of SR, sorry, SRWW for sulfur and nitrogen? And how many apps?" Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I talked, talked a, little a little bit about, about this, this briefly, briefly on the on word, word today, today and, and I'm, I'm getting, getting lots, lots of questions, questions about, about that. that. So, so in, in our, our data, data set, set, we. we uh, 150 pounds per acre of nitrogen was the most economical rate 59% of the time. So six times out of 10, you needed 150 pounds of nitrogen. Four times out of 10, you needed 120 pounds of nitrogen. In between those two numbers, uh, if you were in that range, you were always within $10 of making the most money possible. And so if I can get you within $10 on nitrogen rate of making the most money possible, then I think I've done a pretty good job. So this year, $7 wheat, if you have wheat contracted at $7, seven dollars seven forty, dollars it, it was up to, uh, like those are big prices, straws worth money. I think, we, I think we go to the upper end. We go to the 150. Uh, we have a project underway this year. We're going to look at even higher rates. We looked at higher rates before. We, we didn't really see response up to 180 N. So I... Right now, I wouldn't say to go over 150, but but if you're pushing it, 150 pounds of nitrogen, and then you need at least 15 pounds of sulfur, and that's a minimum on sulfur. And if you went to 20, I wouldn't argue with you at all. And then my only other comment, Sean, is for goodness sakes, look at the lodging potential. Mark's on heavy clay. I don't think he has too much lodging issues, but he does have hog manure. So that's, you know, that ups the ante on on lodging issues. Uh, If you put 150 pounds of nitrogen on in one shot with 20 pounds or 15 pounds of sulfur on early planted wheat, that's a a variety that lodges, you will scrape it off the ground and then you won't get big yields. So there's there's more to that story. Yeah, so just clarification, uh, Wiesberger, Wiesgerber Farms uh, saying 150, oh, LOL, 150 pounds of actual, question uh, mark. He says he must be talking fake rain ground. <laughs> Fake, fake rain, rain ground. ground. Fake, fake. What is fake rain ground? I don't, I don't even, even know, know what, what that, that is. is. I don't no, know, but so, can you so, clarify? Yeah, so 150 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. That's like we've got lots of data here in Ontario, but again, every farm is different. And so, man, if you've got a history of manure and you get residual nitrogen out of that crop, uh, yeah, you can you can get not response to 150 pounds. Uh, Shane and I have, uh, I'm going to say, at least 60 sites over eight years of data, and in that data set. That we found 
six out of ten, uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre, actual nitrogen per acre was was the most economic rate. Yeah, and of course, you know, if you're in you know the heart of the Palliser Triangle, you know, just north of me, uh, it's drier than all get out for the last four years. Your nitrogen level is going to be different than if you are just outside of Lethbridge here and you're on irrigation. Then, then you are talking about some of those high end levels that you were just talking about. So it very much is across the country very ground dependent. Yeah, absolutely. And yield dependent. I mean, gosh, I'm putting 150 pounds of nitrogen on hoping for a minimum of 120 bushels per acre. And on a good year, I'm I'm expecting 140, 150, 160 per acre. Like we're going to push this stuff. We're we're shooting for big yields. If if water is your limiting element, then for goodness sakes, and I don't know where Weesburger Farms is, but it don't put 150 pounds of nitrogen on in the pallets or triangle all up front on your Durham wheat or on your hard red spring wheat because because I will make you go broke doing that. Thank you very much. It's not going to work. So you have to, yeah, it, it's hard without knowing a little more background on where the comments are coming from. He, he clarified, uh, f- fake rain ground is called irrigation. There you go. Oh. Oh, there, there's the, <laughs> there, there's the, cla- one, there's the clarification for for sure. Uh, that that's yeah, good yeah. stuff. Uh, see what else I got for questions here. Can you, uh, Mr. JPJ says on Twitter says, can you add K to mitigate lodging? Oh, so uh, hello, Jeremy, and you know, good question. Uh, so what's really weird is we know that you need potash. For, for stock strength, we know that it's a part of that process. And you would think more potash would give you better standability. But when we looked in the trials, so we have these long-term phosphorus and potash trial locations, and the Allora site has a potash soil test of 55 parts per million. So for, you, for those of you who don't understand that, that's that's way in the sewer. That's that's horrible. I uh, got an email from a grower from Western Canada today, uh, 500 parts per million of potash. That's like, wow, super potash. So like just kind of in the basement potash levels. And when we applied potash on that and looked at standability, we... We saw no difference in standability lodging whatsoever. In fact, at 50 pounds, or pardon me, 50 parts per million, we didn't see lodging. And that was at 120, 130, 140 pounds of nitrogen. We simply didn't see lodging in in virtually any of it. And the added potash didn't prevent the lodging. And I thought it would, but it didn't. What it did, the one year in particular, we, you know, it's a research plot. We have a research combine. We've got a lot of sites to get to. It was the last one we got to. It was late August, and that stuff was ready to combine in early August. In the low potash soil tests with no potash applied, we saw a little bit more uh, what I would call breakdown of the crop, right? So it wasn't lodging, but the stem had kind of folded over four inches below the head. In barley, you'd call it necking, but it wasn't really necking. So a little bit more, but but it didn't impact yield. The stuff didn't go flat. We didn't see lodging. So at the end of the day, in wheat, I don't know that you can apply potash and improve lodging just based on, on what we've seen. In corn, I think it makes a difference. In wheat, i I just not so sure. A lot of interest in 2020 in oats. Uh, we're going to see acres up substantially. Uh, there is concerns about the pricing of that oats once we get to fall based on the increase in supply that's going to be out there. But oats have been a pretty profitable crop for a lot of Western Canadian growers last couple of years. Uh, Danny from Saskatchewan says, can I get an updated take on oat agronomy? Do you have anything there, Pete, from your experience? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, oats, not, not just in Western Canada in the new Lisker district in Ontario, man, oats have become a really profitable crop and people are starting to manage them. So when you say, what's the update? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but early seeding is everything, uh, just like it is with every cereal crop. Phosphorus with the seed, particularly in Western Canada, man, uh, you guys have lots of potash. You have no stinking phosphorus. So get some phosphorus with the seed. I don't care if it's a mid-row band, a double shoot. I want at, at least 
at least 40 pounds of phosphorus down the tube if I could at all. Uh, I think that's a minimum. And, and then early weed control and you manage your nitrogen. So that's the other thing with oats. Oats fall over really, really easy. The best by far bar none growth regulator is nitrogen. You want high yield in oats. That means we have to put on more nitrogen. And in Northern Ontario, we did some of that work. Uh, you know, we thought we needed at least 85 pounds of nitrogen on an oat crop to, to get maximum economic yield. But if it fell over, then you didn't, you know, again, it, it's all a bust. So to push nitrogen rates and not cause lodging, you got to split your nitrogen. And so put two thirds of your nitrogen on up front and then look at what the crop looks like when it hits that second node stage and decide how much more nitrogen to apply. And, and you'll get a way better idea of rainfall. We've talked about this before, right, Sean? What does the crop look like at grow stage 32? Have, has it been cool temperatures? Have you had good rainfall? Do you have big yield potential? Then don't put one third more nitrogen on, put two thirds more nitrogen on, up your nitrogen rate. If you're totally dry and the stand is crappy, then don't put any more nitrogen on. And, and that way you can kind of manage around that. I'm going to get all these text messages. What is growth stage 32? But we don't have time for that. Uh, Devin <laughs> from Saskatchewan says, uh, if you had $10, I, th I think he meant it could be $100. Let's say $10 to spend on a wheat crop. Where would you spend it, Johnson? Oh, Lord, that is, man, I have to spend all $10 on one thing. I'm not going to do that. Won't do it. No, not going to do that. So, so, and, and is it spring or winter wheat? That makes a difference as well. well and what, what let's go with spring wheat, spring wheat, spring wheat. Uh, so, so whatever it takes to get rid of, of the weed pressure in your spring wheat crops out, out West, you, you just, you can't let those weeds go to seed. So I got to do weed control and I don't know, does that take $1 or two dollars uh nitrogen is the next thing uh phosphorus uh, sulfur those those four things weed control nitrogen phosphorus sulfur those would be the things that i would spend it on ah interesting we got a few people in the chat saying i'd spend the ten dollars on marketing uh <laughs> what else okay, we got okay. here go ahead what's that pete I'm, a, I'm an agronomist. We're not doing a marketing <laughs> update here, Sean. <laughs> Lord, Lord, help, help us, man. man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the things I love about real agriculture is just talking to growers from across North America. We got a question here from Ryan from PEI. And he oh, says, oh, cool, cool. you know, Ryan, he says, uh, yep, if yep. growing mustard for seed or green manure, what's a good nitrogen target rate? Oh, wow. oh wow. So mustard is a brassica just like canola and we don't have a lot of, of data on mustard because there's, you know, there's not nearly as many acres, but for a green manure crop, I don't know, I, the payback is not as big. So I would be pretty reluctant to go crazy for a seed crop. Man, I, I think you got to be pushing 120, 130 pounds, somewhere in that range and, and do some trials because Prince Edward Island, I think that's sort of uncharted territory. A, a good cola crop here in Ontario, we would we would want to be 160 of nitrogen, maybe even more than that in some situations if you really have good yield potential. So when I look at that, I, I don't want to go crazy because I don't think the mustard varieties have the breeding behind them for the yield potential that canola has. But uh, I, I'll throw it out numbers just to be wrong. 80 pounds on a, on a plow down crop. And we're going to go with 110 or 120 on a, on a grain crop. Cool. Thanks for your question, Ryan. Uh, what else do I got here? Jared Stegman on Twitter says, when would be the optimum time to pull tissue samples to decide when and if to apply more nitrogen in hard red winter wheat. Oh, dang. <laughs> so, so we don't know. We, so, I mean, theoretically, theoretically, uh, if you, for, for more protein in hard red winter wheat, pull it at flag leaf stage. The flag leaf stage is the only real time of the wheat crop that we think we know a little bit about tissue testing and, and we have to build that database. And interestingly enough, Shane and I have a big project on where we're working on doing some of that. So we understand that better, but the, the nutrient levels 
in the crop change dramatically throughout the life of the crop. And my, the, the easiest way to explain it is when we first, first saw sulfur deficiency, textbooks said 0.5% is critical level of sulfur in wheat. And we would, uh, sorry, 0.2 rather, 0.2% was the critical level in wheat. And, and we would be crops that were 0.23, 0.24. We were seeing sulfur deficiency. We were getting big responses. And so we did all those trials. And at the growth stage, we were sampling, which is kind of uh, just before stem elongation. All right. I won't, growth stage 32 is second node, by the way. But, but just before stem elongation, if you aren't over 0.25% sulfur in your crop, you're deficient. And we learned that even though the textbook said it was 0.2. And then we followed it through the year, and dang it, by the time you got to flag leaf stage, if you were at 0.16, you probably weren't deficient in sulfur. So we got less and less tissue t uh, sulfur for that deficient or that we need to add more. And, and we simply don't have enough of that data for me to tell you exactly when to sample or what that critical level is. We, we don't know what that number is. But flag leaf stage is as close as we could get. And if you're looking at protein, it's a, it's a post-anthesis application anyway. So that's when I would sample. I want to encourage everybody to check out Pete's podcast that uh, he publishes every week where he answers your questions. You got to send his questions to Pete Johnson at realagriculture.com. The podcast is Wheat Pete's Word. So, uh, Pete, you always get lots of great questions from across uh, North America and even over in Europe, too. Yep, yep. I think I think Constantine has sent me one or two questions on the word before, and I get questions from from uh, Pakistan. I get questions from South Africa. It's It's very cool, man. It's very cool. Uh, awesome stuff. Hey, I want to thank everybody for participating here today. Uh, send me your feedback, what you thought about this. This has been awesome. I really appreciate Pete uh, being my, my test of this whole technology. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, so send me your feedback on what you liked, what you think we could do to improve this. We definitely want to do this uh, a lot more going forward. Not sure yet on the frequency or the time of day, but uh, we got some great, great interaction today. I really do appreciate it from all of you that are fans of realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. Oh, by the way, in about 30 minutes on Rural Radio 147, you can hear today's broadcast of Real Ag Radio. So please check that out on Sirius. And if you don't have Sirius, you can download the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. For Peter Johnson and Sean Haney, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in to today's episode, first episode of Real Ag Live. Thanks a lot, everybody.